Well, all right, all right, all right. It's good to have you all here this morning. My name is Matt Brown, and I'm the lead pastor here at LifeHouse. And if you're online, we're so glad you're joining us. And if you're in the room, thanks for being here also. Here's something that um, we want you to know, that we think church should be like the safest place in the world for us to come and grow and learn and ask questions. So here's the parameters of our meeting today. Um, I'm not going to make fun of any of you, and none of you get to come up on stage and smack me in the face. How's that sound? Is that fair? I thought I'd just get that out of the way. Anyway, we are so glad everybody is here. And if you're here and you're new and you're checking this place out, it is a privilege that you decide to spend the morning with us. And we've worked really hard to make it a good experience. Um, here, here's what's going to happen this morning. We're going to be here for about an hour. We're going to sing some great songs. And I'm going to continue the series we've been in. It's called Faithful. And hopefully we'll all grow in our relationship with Jesus. And we mean that if you're new to faith or you've been around the faith world for a long time, we're all all trying to figure it out. Um, one thing I want to let you know is that Easter is in two weeks, and we just always believe that Easter is one of the best times to invite somebody to church. Um, people are tend- will have a tendency to go, yeah, I'll, I'll join you. So invite someone, sit with them. Hopefully that's a really good experience. So now we're going to jump into our first song, and I just want you to know this song talks about God's crazy, fierce, overwhelming love for us. And if you're in a place this morning, whether you're online or in the room, that you just need to experience God's love, I hope you can lean in and you can sense that and experience that today. So let's stand up and let's sing together. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, all of us, we're all coming in here from different places in life, different stages, different experiences, things we're going through right now. Um, and for all of us, there's some craziness going on in our world right now, right? It's a little, a little chaotic. There's darkness in our world, maybe darkness in our own lives. And we believe that Jesus is hope for us. He's hope in the midst of our darkness. Maybe that's the first time you ever heard that. Maybe you've never known that, that there's a God who loves you and loves me. Uh, maybe this is the first time you're hearing this. And, and the good news is that there's hope. And there's hope because of God and his love for us and what he's done for us through Jesus, his son. We have living hope that we can hold on to today because of Jesus. We want to sing about that. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your Tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living. Who could imagine so great? Could find 
Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. Thank you guys so much for singing with us. You can take your seats. So good to sing with you all about the love that God has shown to us through Jesus. Uh, when we don't deserve it, God has loved us. He's working in our lives. He's working through us. Um, he's working in, in this room. And it's not just with us in this room that he's working through and working with. Um, you know, we've got kids in their environments. We've got students in their environments where they get to do the same thing. They get to sing songs. And they get to sit around with people and hear about how much God loves each one of them. And our students, our high school and middle school students especially, if you've never been back there, they get to be a part of an incredible environment week in and week out where they have a chance to grow in their faith and to connect with other people. Um, to connect with Jesus. It's an awesome thing, but, but you guys know this. Sometimes, sometimes it helps to kind of step away and step out of an environment to see something in a different way, right? That's why we, that's why we need days off of work. That's why we need uh, breaks from things. But, but um, these students get a chance this summer uh, to go to summer camp. And it's, again, a chance to get out of Van Wert, Ohio for just a minute and connect with Jesus in a different and a fresh way. Um, we've got over 80 high school, middle school students that would love to go and have that experience, to grow their faith, to have an experience that might change their lives. And the cool thing is that we get to be a part of that. We get to help them 
get there. Um, if you guys have, uh, if you're in the room, out in the lobby, there's a huge board with faces of all 80 of those kids that are going to camp. And we have a chance to come alongside them and sponsor them because it costs money to go to camp, right? Um, and, and we have a goal of raising 100% of that sponsorship goal. And that won't get them all the way there, but it'll get them a, a good way down the field. And um, we have a week left to try to um, hit that sponsorship goal 100%, send these kids to camp and let them have an experience where they can know how much God loves them. Um, so if you're in the room after the service, man, just head out to the board and grab a tag. Um, you, can, you can donate 25 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever you can do to help show these kids how much we love them. Um, and if you're online, you can do the same thing. Just click on the link in the chat box and that'll give you an opportunity to sponsor a kid. And, and listen, we're not just covering costs for them, right? That's part of it. But again, we're giving them a chance to connect with our Heavenly Father in a really unique way. So I would love for all of us to do that. Let's send these kids, let's hit 100% of that goal, send those kids to camp. Um, thank you guys so much for doing that, for being a part of that. And thank you for everyone who, um, who maybe you give generously week in, week out. Um, we're really grateful for that. If you're new, you shouldn't feel the need to give. You're just glad you're here. But if, if you call Lifehouse home, thank you so much for being a part of this mission, of leading people in a growing relationship with Jesus. Well, we're going to continue on with the rest of our service. Matt's going to come up and he's going to keep walking us through this idea of seeing our faith grow and with our message series called Faithful. You know, there's a word that most of us have a love-hate relationship with. I, I know that I have a love-hate relationship with this word when I see it and I have to live it out. It's this word, it's called discipline. Isn't that a challenging word? I mean, discipline is the friend you hate to see coming, but when it's been around you for a while, you're glad that friend was there. You hate to start out in something, but after you've been disciplined for a little while, you're so grateful that you did whatever you're trying to be disciplined in it. Hate it, I like it, I love it, I despise it. Here's the thing I know on the other side of discipline, we never regret it. Just like we never regret having good habits in our life. You would say that. They're hard to start, but once you have good habits, you're so grateful for them. And you and other people in your life are so thankful for self-control in your life and other people's lives. And it's hard to have self-control in multiple areas in our lives because we're just kind of broken in that way. But when we have it, when we figure out how to do it, self-control is so strong. And here's the thing for most of these cases, that motive, motive is unrelated to outcome. And attitude is related to outcome. And what I mean by that is I can start out trying to eat more healthy, trying to eat clean, as they say these days, and I can have the worst attitude in the world, can I? I can be grouchy, I can moan about it, complain about it, but after a month, even if my attitude is still bad, I'm better off that I ate better than when I started, even if my attitude was bad, which we don't always think of because we think you have to have a good attitude to get results. That's not true. When it comes to our physical bodies, you can have a bad attitude and see good results. And here's what happens often, though, with that. Ought to, ought to becomes I want to. And endure becomes enjoy along the way. I remember facing this when I was a freshman in high school. I joined a high school wrestling team. Listen, I was the same weight going into high school as I was the kids coming out of high school. Just a completely different human being, though. I was soft, and I was chubby, and I was flat, flabby, and then I got in really good shape, and then I turned into this as an adult. Anyway, that's another subject we'll have to figure out later on with discipline. And one of the things you had to do on our high school wrestling team before 
for every practice is you had to run the stairs for 15 minutes. And you had to run up three flights of stairs down a long hallway and three flights of stairs down and repeat that for 15 minutes. And I remember as a freshman in high school just hating it. I mean, I almost quit. I didn't want to do it. It was painful. And then I just started working at it. And I never really enjoyed it my freshman year, my sophomore year, and my junior year. I started to get in shape and get strong. By the time I was a senior in high school, I looked forward to those 15 minutes as much as anything else in my day because I could just run almost full out for 15 minutes getting ready to train and wrestle. And what had to be turned into something I enjoyed, what was ought to turn into something I enjoy doing. And that's, that's what happens often with disciplines and habits. They can be life-changing and that's true with all forms of exercise, which most of us, you know, struggle with. That's true if you decide I'm going to work less hours at work so I can come home with being my kids because they're only going to be six years old, eight years old once in their life. That can be true when you're working on relationship stuff with your spouse, your significant other, and it's hard and you have to be disciplined in it. That can be true when it comes to spending, like I'm going to spend less and save more. That's very difficult in the front end. And of course, it's true when I'm trying to have less sugar in my life, which I'm really hoping heaven's just full of peanut butter chip ice cream and steaks. That's my goal for heaven and lots of Jesus. Anyway, here's what we know, that discipline, discipline facilitates progress. Personally, corporately, nationally, our world is better when there's discipline in it. It's true of church world and discipline facilitates prosperity. And this doesn't mean like, hey, if you do these things, God's going to make your checkbook, you know, multiply by a thousand times. Come on, let's be careful with that. But you just know this in the regular world, when you have discipline, you typically can be more prosperous. Now here's the challenge with all these things, good habits and discipline and sacrifice. They all require delayed gratification. And I hate delayed gratification as a human being. I love the pleasures of this earth. I just do. I'll confess that's why I need discipline. And delayed gratification is simply this, that doing what we ought to do now so we can do what we want to do later. I'm doing what I should do today so I can do what I want to do later. Some of you have joined the Financial Peace University class we have. It's Dave Ramsey, how, you know, how to get healthy in your finances. And he just, he just goes at it hard. You have to sacrifice today. You have to live like no other today so you can live like no one else in your future. You have to eat peanut butter and jelly and not go out to eat. And you got to get out of debt because someday when you are out of debt and you're financially secure, because delayed gratification, you can live like you never thought you could live, but that's the rub, isn't it? I just say no to some things today so I can say yes to better things in the future. Now, we'll come back to that in just a minute because we're in part five of this series. It's called Faithful, Fueling Your Faith in a World on Empty. And we've been talking about for the last five weeks that when Jesus ran into his followers, he would invite them to follow him and not just believe in him, Believing was okay, but following was everything. And he asked them to follow him, to have an active, live, gritty, I got confidence in my heavenly father, kind of faith. And he never changed that. He never backed down from that. And he would say to his followers, hey, I want you guys to follow me. Because this is personal. Watch the way I live. Watch the way I respond. Watch how I love people, forgive people, do the hardest things. And trust your heavenly father as you follow me that God's going to show up and build our hearts to follow him with confidence and reflect who I am. And again, Jesus never changed the follow me, follow me, follow me. And then the church came along. People like me came along and I take responsibility for some of this. And we took follow me and we just turned it into believe in me. And you have to believe and it's important to believe. So you got to start somewhere. But when you stop with just believe, there's no change in our lives. Because you can believe in anything, right? I believe, I believe, but not have any change. And if it's just in my head or to talk church talk, if it's in my heart, that's great. But it's when it's practiced and it comes out of us, our faith grows. And we're convinced that Jesus wanted us to have a deep, strong faith, not a fragile faith. In fact, for some of you, whether you're online or you're in the room, you've come back to faith. And the faith you originally had was so fragile that when you ran into some hard stuff, it crumbled, it broke. And now you're asking the question, how do I have strong faith? And I want to believe, but more than that, I want to, I want to live this out. So we've been asking this question for all of us. Even if you're just investigating faith, what, what would I do? 
How would I live? How would I react? How would I treat them? What would I avoid in my life if I was confident that God was with me? This is the life of faith. I wake up every morning and God, I'm I'm confident you're with me and I'm marching forward. That's what Jesus called his followers to 2,000 years ago, which is exactly what he's called us to do. It creates strong faith. And we ask this question, what fuels or facilitates the development of active, enduring faith? And we want enduring faith for our littlest kids in Wombaland all the way to our oldest attendees. Enduring faith that lasts the test of time. Now, this is what's fascinating for many of us. You know people who have faith like this. And you watch them. You watch their confidence in God. They run into hard things. They're like, yep, this is really hard. This is really awful. But I'm trusting God. I know he's still active and alive in my life. Now, over the years, as we've heard people's faith stories, there are five things that seem to show up when people talk about their faith. It could be six, there could be seven, but there, there's five things that keep showing up in every season of people's faith life. And over the last several weeks, we've been talking about that. And the first thing we talked about is practical teaching. And you'll hear people tell their faith story and they'll be like, you know what? I was raised in church or I knew about God or I kind of believed in God and I didn't get it. And I walked in. I walked into a camp environment. I walked into a conference. We hear this story all the time around here. I came to Lifehouse and I sat there for the first time and it was like an aha moment. I never understood and somehow it was practically explained explained to me and it just made sense. And not that it just made sense. I started doing it and applying it. And I was terrified. Like I was trying to do what I was taught. And as I did, God showed up and God was faithful And as God was faithful, my faith blew up. And I want you and I want myself and my kids and all of us to experience God's faithfulness. It's practical teaching. The second thing we hear people talk about in their faith story is this idea of personal ministry. And so many of you would be able to talk about this in this place because you do this around here. Like I I walked across the yard to help my neighbor for the very first time and they were grouchy people, but I decided to help anyway and minister to them. Or I walked into Wombala and I had to sit on the floor and tell four-year-olds about Jesus. And I never told anybody about Jesus in my entire life. And then I did it. And I was like, God, if you ever are going to help me, help me now. And they responded. And it was like, God showed up. Now, this is what's cool. I talked about this two or three weeks ago. And I, a gob of you filled out those little cards that said, I'm very interested in serving at LifeHouse. It was overwhelming. The stacks were this big. And I'm really proud of you that did that. And um, we've responded to you. And a lot of you have taken the next step. Um, you're going to do a backstage pass in the next couple of weeks. You've signed up for that. That means on a Sunday morning, you get to tour our environments when all this fun is happening and see behind the scenes. And then you can decide maybe where you want to jump in. If you have not responded back to that invite to do that and you signed up, please do that. Because you know this. It's not enough just to sign a card. It's actually doing it. I'd love for you to be a part of personal ministry around here. And then last week, Andy, our video teaching pastor, he spoke to all of us about providential relationships. And when you hear people talk about their faith stories, so often you hear, and then my neighbor came over and they prayed with me and they invited me to church and they sat with me and they were there when I needed them or I had a Sunday school teacher, a small group leader or that person that just invested in me. And when I look back, I just wonder where my life would have gone without that person. And it felt providential. Like God put them in my life. And I'm so thankful that we have so many of those relationships going on around here. Today, I want to talk about the fourth faith catalyst. And that's private disciplines. Specifically, private spiritual disciplines. And and you know this, you've heard this. When people tell their faith story, often people will say, and then I decided. I decided every day to read the scripture. I read the scripture and it's like my faith grew or I decided to pray and not the prayers like, oh, Jesus, help me find a parking spot, right? Help my kid to win the baseball game. Those are fine prayers, but space, people will say, I found space to talk to my heavenly father like I would anyone else I'm having a relationship with. Or I decided I'm going to be a percentage giver and I pried open my checkbook and gave a little bit of my money away to invest in someone else in this world. Or for you, it's like I decided to show up. I decided to consistently show up to a small group or to church. And I just, I mean, something changed on the inside. And what I ought to do became something I enjoy to do. 
See, here's the key when it comes to private spiritual disciplines. It's usually centered around predeciding something ahead of time. Not because I'm emotionally moved, not because the pastors talked me into it, but I decide ahead of time that I'm going to get up first thing in the morning, set my alarm 10 minutes early, and I'm going to read the scripture and talk to God. Or ahead of time, I'm going to go online, I'm going to set up a reoccurring percentage account because I want to make sure I give some of my church, my money back to what God is doing in our world. And see, what happens when you show up ahead of time that builds reps in our life. And you know this, anytime you build reps in your life, you do something over and over again, it forms habits and discipline. And sometimes it does. It starts out with I have to or I ought to, but so often it ends up as I enjoy it and I'm glad about it. And this is why this is so important because this is all about a personal relationship with God. It's not about just showing up to church it's not just about marking some box and I'm a religious person, I'm doing religious stuff. It is about a relationship with God. It is personal. And that is why Jesus' invitation always was follow me. Not a religious system, not some organization. Follow me. It's personal every day of our lives. Now, for me, this was not hard to imagine or understand growing up because of who my parents were. And you've heard me talk about my parents. My mom is the kind of people, person that when she prays, you just know she's talking to God. It's, no, it's not made up. She reads the scripture. It's so personal. She's so relational. It just oozes out of her. And I watch my mom fall in love with Jesus more every day of my life. So it's easy for me to imagine that. Maybe as important was my father who was not as relational. But he decided following God was the right thing for him to do. And so he just decided, I'm all in. My dad, who was a college president, was a very busy man. He'd wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. 4 o'clock in the morning, my friends. I don't even know how you do that, right? And he would read the scriptures. And for a long sin, he would just pray. And he decided for a while just to pray for an hour a day. Because this was something that was difficult for him, and it's what he ought to do, but it came a discipline and a habit in his life. And I tell you that because some of you, you may not have grown up with that. So it's harder to see it and understand it. But when we put these in external factors in our lives, it affects us internally. And then the internal stuff affects us on the outside stuff. And we need both. We need routine. We need discipline. But we also need the relationship with the God that we're doing it for. Because if you do not have the relationship part with the discipline part, this is really important. You grow cold and you become legalistic and judgmental. And you become a mean Christian. And some of you met some mean Christians. They, they checked all the boxes. I read my Bible and I pray and I show up to church. And you're mean. And you miss it. It's a relationship with our Heavenly Father that teaches us to love and have discipline. And when we lose that, we're no longer following. We are just Christian. Or just a label. It's not intimate. It's not relational. It's just stuff I'm doing. And no one of us want to be that person. But it still takes discipline for us to say, God, and this is really what discipline does when it comes to a relationship with God. I love you and I want your rule in my life. I want you to rule my life because I trust you you. I believe Jesus is the Lord, but not just Lord of you know, heaven and earth. You're, you're Lord of me. So please, God, do something in me. And so there, there's a couple areas I just want to talk about today. We'll put them up on the screen around private disciplines. I want to talk about daily devotions, percentage giving, and corporate worship. Um, and this may not be the language you use when you talk about these things, but this is what we hear all the time. And if we talk about daily devotions, it's simple. It's every day. I decide I'm going to take some time in the beginning of my day to read what God wrote to me through his love letter we call the scriptures so we would understand God. And I'm going to take time to pray, and it's going to be personal. And I'm going to be prompted by what I read. Like, I'm going to read stuff, and I'm going to ask God, all right, God, help me to walk according to what I'm reading and digesting. Because sometimes when you read the scriptures, you're challenged I was thinking about this the other day. There are some things in the scriptures, now listen to me completely before you judge me on this. There are some things in the scriptures I disagree with because I don't personally like them. But I'm still challenged to go, okay, God, if this is from you, I have to wrap my life around this, not make it wrap around me. 
And when I read the scriptures, I'm called to follow Jesus. And let's just be honest, the thing that's toughest for most of us is when Jesus says, forgive, you know, recklessly for, with people. Oh, well, that's hard. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I know. But this is what we're called to do. And we're called to follow Jesus. And Jesus did these things himself. Matthew, who followed Jesus personally and then documented the journey later on in life, he, he quoted Jesus by saying, but when you pray, this is awesome. That means you have a set time when it's a time in your day when you pray, he goes on, when you pray, go into your room and he closed the door and pray to your father who is unseen. And we don't understand how challenging this was because in those days, homes were very small and lots of people lived inside them and doors were made out of leather. So there was almost no privacy in Jesus goes, I know, but when you pray, you find a quiet place and give God your undivided attention. Now, the beauty of this is that Jesus, he modeled this because he needed this himself. Luke, Luke, who documented Jesus' story, tells us, he said, yet the news about him, Jesus, spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. Context, everybody wanted to be around Jesus. Everybody wanted Jesus' time. He was a guy that was in demand because of what he could do. And he was doing the most important work the world had ever seen. He was saving the world. And as busy as he was, Luke tells us that Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and he just prayed. Jesus, why are you praying? You're so busy. You're so busy. Jesus, why are you taking time to pray? And Jesus would smile and say, because I'm so busy and I'm doing a more important work than you'll all ever do. I'm going to go die on the cross and rise from the dead so the world can be saved. But I have to be with my heavenly father to recoup and keep going. Mark who documented Peter's story. And Peter did life with Jesus for three years. He writes this. He says, very early in the morning, where it was still dark, Jesus got up and he left the house and he went off to a solitary place, there it is, where he prayed. Now he's with his 12 apostles. They wake up. Jesus is gone again. They've lost Jesus. Dang it, we lost Jesus again. That must have been what they said to each other. And we're told that Simon... And his companions went to look for them. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus, we lost you again. And we're a little annoyed because we have an agenda today. And there's 27 things on our agenda that we got to get figured out. There's so much to do. Why are you out here praying? To which Jesus would smile and say, because we have so many things to do. I need to spend time with my heavenly father. And if we're going to endure this, I got to be as close to my father as I possibly can be. And so the invitation around this for all of us, including myself, is would we be, be willing to give the first few minutes of our day to God? Because you know this, you get up and you're tempted just to jump into everything that's coming ahead of you. Like I get all the kids ready and they're driving me crazy. I got to meet with my boss and that may be good or be bad. I may find some temptation over lunch and I want to orientate my day around Jesus and my heavenly father. Now, I want to back up for just a minute because this is really important. I told you that my father, for a long period of his life, he would get up and he would pray for an hour long straight. And you're like, holy cow, Matt, there's no way I can do that. And I would just say this to you. It is infinitely better to get up and spend five or ten minutes in the scripture and praying. Infinitely better than spending no time in the scripture and praying. Infinitely better. And so if you're like, hey, I'm going to try five, ten minutes, do that. Do that. That's huge for you. And then you can surrender your day to all the temptations around the day. But here's when it comes to our time, and you know this, you have to pre-decide, God, I'm going to surrender my will to you by spending time with you and your truth. So when the temptations come today and fear comes and anxiety comes, I will be ready. Daily, daily devotions. It informs our conscience it guides our steps that we need that daily. And when we don't do that, I'm convinced our faith gets fragile and it breaks so easy because you're going to face some stuff every day of your life. And this is a big deal. So I'm inviting you to consider this to grow your faith. Now, the second discipline. The second discipline is percentage giving. And I know that everybody's like, oh gosh, we're talking about giving. Stay with me for a minute. Let me start by this. The people in this room and the people online that are going to be challenged most by this are the men. 
This is a big deal for us men because most likely the women who are smarter than us are already on board with doing this because they're just more intuitive when it comes to this kind of stuff. But for us men, and maybe this is you ladies, I don't know, but for men, I know this is true. We are so wrapped up in who we are by how much we have, how secure financially we are, how much we get to spend, what we drive, what boat we have on the lake, whatever it is, that it is so hard to pry open our hands when it comes to what we have. And this is why for all of us, we have to pre-decide to go, you know what? I'm going to give a percentage ahead of time. I'm going to decide ahead of time. Whether I automate it or have somebody else write the check for me, I'm going to decide ahead of time to do this. Now, because I know the temptations, when I speak on this, people are like, Matt just wants our money. He just wants our money for church. Here's what I'm going to just give you freedom to do. If, you're, if you've never done this percentage giving before and you don't trust me with it, give it to some other church. Just give it to some other church. I'm fine with that. Because this is about your faith, not us, you know, having more today. Give it to some other church, but here's the key of it. It's, God, I'm going to trust you with what I rely on most. It's a priorities thing. It's not a money thing. It's a faith thing. It's confidence in God. And here's what's so interesting. When Jesus was on the planet, times were so very difficult. So many people, especially in the Jewish world, which his people were from, they were under Roman rule, which means it was hard, it was tough, and they were taxed almost to death. And you were always on the brink of starving to death or not 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. And Jesus looks at him, and Matthew, he's writing this down because he's there. Jesus looks at these people that are in danger all the time, and he says, so, do not worry. Pause, pause, pause. How many of you would say this defines you right now? Don't, don't raise your hand, don't... How many of you just feel like, yeah, worry is just all around me? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Now, the truth is for us, most of us have not struggled with that. We all have something to wear. Most of us have something to eat. Most of us have something to drink. You know what our challenge is? God, um, I'm really worried about where my kids are going to go to college. How am I going to make more money at my job? I've got to remodel the bathroom and I need more shiplap and I don't know where to get more shiplap and I need a walk-in shower. And I hope you have all that. I mean, I hope you have one of those toilets that sprays water on you. I hope you have all that. I do. I, I think that'd be great. You have that. But we worry about that, right? And Jesus said, don't worry about that. Well, I don't get to have a vacation like my sister gets to have a vacation. Don't worry about that. Because our challenge is, God, what if I don't have enough and Jesus says this thing that's so, it's a, so offensive to his followers 2,000 years ago, and it should be offensive to us. He said, yeah, um, the pagans, the people that don't believe, or the people that worship all these weird, crazy gods, you know the people that we, we really don't want to follow in their footsteps because it's so unhealthy. They run after these things. And I'm cut to the core. They run after these things. You, you think it's all about you. You don't think about what I'm responsible for as your heavenly father. The pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father, he knows that you need him. Your heavenly father knows your kids need to go to college. Your heavenly father knows you have bills to pay. Your heavenly father knows you need a job. Your heavenly father knows and he cares. Now here's a caveat that sometimes people like me don't say to this. This does not excuse us from hard work, keeping a job, making money. We are responsible for those things. But when you do your part, there's a place to go. I don't want to be like the pagans, Jesus. I want to trust my heavenly father. And this is what it comes down to when, when he says this. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe Jesus? Now, if you're new to Christianity, if you're new to faith and church and Jesus, and you're not like, you're not sure, that's totally fine. We just would love for you to keep coming back and being part of our crew. But for some of us, we've been doing this for a while. And the truth is, we don't believe Jesus that our Heavenly Father knows. We don't believe Jesus that our Heavenly Father knows our name and knows our kids. And this is so much more than, hey, I just want to go to heaven. This is a big deal because when you die, you have no choice in where you go. That's in God's hands. Now, you can trust that through Jesus. But really, once I die, I mean, I hope it works out. That's kind of how you can look at it. But this whole prying my hands around my finances, being a percentage giver, is a way I can actively say, God, I am letting go of some control. I'm letting go of having to be the Lord of my own life. Now, men, back to you for just a second. This is what I hear men say all the time. I'll be generous 
when I see a crisis. I'll be generous when I see a need. In fact, some of you, and I hope you all do this, when you heard about the kids that need to go to camp, you haven't given all year to anything, and you're like, oh, I'm gonna go take care of that because I wanna be the savior of the kids. But really, if you think about that, is that really trusting God with your life? And I, I hope you all go sponsor those kids. But for us men, it's like, I'm not, I don't need to be the savior. I don't need to have a savior complex. I don't need to be in control. I'm gonna just trust God with, with the thing that defines me so often. That's what I have. And this is what Jesus would invite people to do all the time. Jesus would say, with every part of your life, including your finances, seek first his kingdom and all of his righteousness. Your will be done in me, heavenly father. And all these things will be given to you as well because your father knows that you need them and your father loves you. See, when it comes to this whole idea, challenging statement, giving exercises our faith because it involves letting go of what we are most inclined to put our confidence in rather than God. And again, if you're a woman in this place, maybe this is with you, but I know for us men, our confidence is what we stored up, how much we have, how much we draw, what we drive. And God does not want your confidence to be in that. That's why Jesus said you can't have two masters. And he didn't say you can't have two masters. One would be God and the other would be the devil because that'd be stupid because no one wants the devil to be their master. So Jesus said you can't have God be your master and money be your master because you'll be loyal to one and not the other. So decide which one you're going to trust. And the only way to really do that is to decide ahead of time to be generous and the number one contender for our faith is our financial security for most of us. Because our tendency, and I'm just, I'm right in there with you guys. Because our tendency is to go, hey, but this is, this is mine. I earned this. This is what I got coming to me. It's all mine. And your heavenly father says, no, I want you to be mine. And you can't serve two masters. Um, when Tina and I, my wife, when we were first married, we were doing ministry up in Minnesota, getting paid nothing. And we made this nervous decision to be percentage givers, to be 10 percentage givers. I would never ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. And we made so little money. I mean, I was like, do we have to? Yeah, we ought to. And it wasn't like, hey, do we give and not eat and eat and not give? It was like, do we give and not have cable TV? That was our dilemma, right? That was a challenge. So it wasn't a huge sacrifice. But I remember in those early years going, all right, God, whew, we're trusting you with our lives. And I, I look to see what we get to be a part of now. And I'm just so glad that my wife helped me to trust God when I didn't really want to. And when I'm, when I'm not willing to pry open my hands... I have to ask the question, why? Why? You see, this is something I want us all to wrestle with. And again, if you think, hey, Matt's just trying to give, get our money, give it to another church. That's fine. I mean, that's fine. But when we learn the why behind this, that it's not about money, it's about confidence in God. It's about surrender. It's about faith. It's the fact that I really believe God has my whole world in his hands and I don't want to run after things like the pagans do. Something inside me changes and I follow percentage giving percentage giving it's how our faith grows because it's what matters so much to us and you've got to decide ahead of time and I hope you wrestle with this and I hope you say yes to growing your faith and following your heavenly father it's a it's a powerful step last one is this idea of corporate worship now it's so interesting when we talk about private disciplines that we talk about corporate worship but you know this because you guys are smart people that coming here is bigger than just hearing me speak or singing a couple songs. It's more than just a message. You, you see, corporate worship, corporate worship, next slide, is something that happens personally when we gather corporately. There's this weird thing, and I can't really explain it, but there's a group dynamic that impacts me personally. That when I'm with all of you, I'm impacted on the inside out. And some of you have experienced this. Some, in fact, in the lobby after first service today, I had a God, but people say, we have not been here in a while. And I'm like, I'm so glad you came back. And I heard this so many times. I forgot what it's like to experience this with other people. 
And there's that weird thing, you sing that song together, and it's just a song you sung a million times, but somehow when you connect with the hearts of everyone else in the room and Jesus in the room, it's different. You hear a story, and you can hear the story anywhere, but you hear it with other people that you're trying to do life with, and something inside you changes. In fact, 2020, this is what we heard a lot of, I miss church, I miss church, and I miss church. But you know what I didn't miss? I didn't miss the building. I had the keys to the building. I work in the building. It was empty. I did not miss this building at all. I love our building. But I did not miss the building. I miss you guys. I miss the kids running through the hallways and the teenagers that are smelly but trying to figure out their faith. I missed all that. Love it. Love it. But I didn't miss the building. And it's not even the preaching. In fact, if you want a different kind of preaching, here's the cool thing about the world we live in, and I hear this all the time, I wanna, I wanna do deep teaching, deep teaching. You can click on your computer and hear any teaching you want in the whole world. If you want some other different kind of preaching, I suggest you just go to your computer, take some responsibility, and listen and watch and learn. But here, it's about hearing together and growing together. It's a we thing, it's a Jesus thing. Jesus said this really weird thing around um, a church conflict um, when he was on the planet. He said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them, or in the midst of them. And I don't know how to explain this, but somehow when we get together where it's five of us or 20 of us or a thousand of us, somehow Jesus is here differently. He's always with you, but he's here differently. And we experience him when we gather in Jesus' name. It's different than anything else. Social gatherings, athletic gatherings, those are all great things. But when we gather in Jesus' name, it's more than learning. It's an experience. And in a world where we value, I'm an individual, I'm an individual, don't tread on my individualism, that's fine. But we experience God in a special way together. And here, here's maybe why. You sit down in the seat and there's an empty seat next to you. You don't know who's going to sit there. But it's good for you to sit next to him. You drive in the parking lot and you walk in and there's another family, another single person walking in with you and you're like, hey, it's good to see you, high five. And it's connection with God's people and other people in this world. You walk back and you see those little beautiful Wombaland kids jumping up and down and talking about Jesus and shouting about Jesus. And you realize together there's synergy around his name. The Apostle Paul wrote to a little church in a place called Corinth years ago. He says, now you, and he's writing to the church He's writing in second person, so if you're really going to get this right, he would say, now you all. I'm from southern Illinois. Everybody was you all where I grew up. But now you all. You all is you. Online people, in the room people. Now you all. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. When we gather as a group, there is an aspect of our faith that we can only experience when we're together. And apart from you, I can't experience that part of my faith. And here's the part that's a discipline. I need to choose to participate. Now, I love our online audience, and I'm so glad we have it, and we will continue to have it for as long as I am in charge around here. But I also want to bring value to the fact that when we gather, it's really important. It's a discipline to show up on Sunday morning, especially if you have five kids and they all are a little squirrely to get them all in the car, but it does something for them. It does something for you. It makes your faith grow and get bigger. And most of us could tell stories about that. And so if you're tempted to isolate and be by yourself, just keep pushing that away and engage, engage and let this be a challenge that might grow your faith. In fact, here's the challenge for you. I want to give you all a 30 day challenge. Now, because I'm a pastor, you may expect the first thing I want to challenge you to is just the giving challenge, and that's not where I want to start. I want you for 30 days to embrace some spiritual disciplines. For one month, I want you to seek Jesus' kingdom. And I recognize some of you are doing this so well, you just need to cheer the rest of us on. But for those of us that don't do this so well, just a 30-day challenge to put these into practice. And the 30-day challenge would be simply, hey, God, I want to give you the first minutes of my day. Before I do anything else, God, I'm going to give you the first minutes of my day. 30 days, I'm going to try and I'm going to see what happens. And then I'm going to give you the first dollars of my income. And again, if you're like 10% is way too much, just pick a percentage and start there. And again, if you want to give it to some other church, do that. Just start for your own good. And then I'm going to give you the first day of the week. Really, it's the first morning of the week. 
On Sunday morning, I'm going to participate in corporate worship. I'm going to be a part. I'm going to do my devotionals every day for the first part of my day. And then I'm going to give the first percentage of my income. Some of you have never done that. And you've been in church way too long to not have tried it yet. And then I'm going to give you the first morning of the week. It's a challenge. And for you, you may be like, oh, this is going to totally be an ought to thing. And I'm going to kind of grumble and complain about it. But what if it leads you to bigger faith? What if it challenges you personally to find intimacy with your heavenly father? What if it causes you to go, Jesus, I'm so glad you're Lord of the universe. (laughs) But Lord, but Jesus, I I really think you're becoming Lord of my life. My faith's getting stronger. It's getting more in depth. I have confidence in you like I've never had before. Every time I read the scriptures, it like guides me to the true north that I need to go. So to get us all going, we wanted to give you one free resource, and that's simply this, um, a devotional for the next 14 days. I wanted you to try this for 30 days, but we're going to give you a 14-day devotional. And the cool thing about this, if you text LifeHouse to this number, tomorrow morning we're going to send you the first devotional back through your phone. And it's 14 days that lead you right up to Easter. Is that not the coolest thing? Which means you could position yourself perfectly for Easter morning to celebrate the resurrection of the one we love with all of our hearts. And for maybe for you, You're not even sure if you believe in Easter, but it would set you up to ask questions and be in the best place you possibly can. And the devotional is around the people of Easter. And every day you're going to get one sent to you. You don't have to do anything, but open up your phone and you can spend a few minutes with God. Now, if you're online, there's a link that you can click that will take you to the same thing. But if you're in the room or online, you can text LifeHouse to this number and you'll start getting those at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. This is a great place to start. This is a discipline. This is seek first the kingdom of God, intimacy, relationship through discipline. I'm doing this and I'm asking you all to join me in this. So would you, would you do that? Would you accept the 30 day challenge, the first minutes of my day, first percentage of my income and the first morning of my week on a Sunday morning to be part of what we're doing here and see if our faith does not get better. Now, before we wrap all this up, I need to say this is kind of a public service announcement, but maybe this is a, this is a, a faith step for you too. Next Sunday, I'm going to wrap this message up by talking about what happens with our faith when really hard times come, when difficult times come, when pain comes, when loss comes. And if you know somebody that is either go, going through that now or has gone through that recently, I would love for you to invite them because it might be helpful to them. And that might help grow your faith as well. 30 day challenge, invite somebody and let's let our faith grow up and blow up and be as big as it possibly can. Let me pray for you. Heavenly father, thank you that sometimes we got to get a little rattled to respond, be challenged. Sometimes we have to do some ought to things before we get to the want to things. I pray that we would consider these disciplines, these habits, these ways of living our life that would help us see you more clearly and surrender to you. And ultimately, Lord, not make us bitter or judgmental, but help us to embrace your love for us and love other people so very well. Thank you for a church that wants to grow and figure this out. We love you and we thank you for loving us. It's in your name I pray, amen. Have a good day, everybody.